Good morning. Now that your sourdough starter is active, we're going to go ahead and make our very first sandwich loaf together, a sourdough sandwich loaf. I made one yesterday, so we'll be making another. <laughs> but I want to show you what it looks like. It's beautiful. It's light, it's not too heavy and dense. It may not look beautiful to you, <laughs> but I promise it's delicious. So this is what we're gonna do. Because one of the things that then helps make your kitchen more sustainable, right, is making something of your own. And bread is pretty ubiquitous in just about every culture and every household, really. Of course, there's variations to that, but we're gonna stick with the, the standard whole wheat sandwich bread. Now you can see I store mine in a gallon like Ziploc baggie, but then I also put it in these linen bags, these bread linen bags. I don't close the Ziploc baggie because I find if you close it, then no air escapes and then you start to get mold. But if I just put it in the linen bag, I find it gets hard as a rock pretty quick. So with a combination of the two, I'm able to, able to keep it fresh and soft for at least a week, which is about how long it takes us to go through this. So the very first thing you're gonna do when you want to make any type of sourdough loaf is have an active fed starter. So this is Giuseppe. The starter that we were making together, I have over here on the counter, I just fed it. And I'm not using that because it's not fully active yet. So you're only moving to this stage once you have a fully active, mature starter that doubles every time you feed it. It may take a few hours, right? It's not gonna happen immediately, but it does double in volume. So Giuseppe has been in the refrigerator and I need to feed him. I, I can't just use him, use the starter in this way, right? It has to be active, it has to be bubbly and doubled in volume. This is my discard container. So I'm just gonna discard, but I remember I saved my discard and then there'll be another video showing you what you can do with that. But for now, I just take some away and I keep it in here and then I keep it in the refrigerator. also need to feed my starter because tomorrow is a pizza night and I am making a sourdough pizza crust so I need to get this fed for two reasons. And this is going to take a few hours to double because it's been in the refrigerator so it's pretty cold. And because I want a decent amount, I'm actually going to go up to 80 and add 80 grams of water as well. Mix it up. You like the, the paraphernalia here on the counter? <laughs> I didn't even bother to clean the counter off before I turned the camera on. These are deer antlers, deer sheds, that we found on our farm this past weekend. We were walking through the woods just enjoying the day. It was a beautiful day. And literally found those. My kids found those. All mixed up, scraping down the sides. You'll notice I'm, I'm doing the exact same process that we've been doing throughout our starter creation journey. Cover it up and I'm just going to put it in a warm spot and we will come back once it's doubled. It's been five hours since I fed. I want you to see, probably this right there, that's the line. It has doubled. So it took about five hours. 
It probably was doubled prior to this, but this is the chance I've had to continue to the next step. So now that we have an active mature starter, let's go ahead and mix up our dough. And so when you're making bread, you don't need fancy ingredients. I want you to really try to make this as simple on yourself as possible, right? The more simplistic it is, not only the easier is it for you, but the more you're apt to do it, right? The more complicated things get, that's when we just kind of shy away from them a little bit at times. So you really only need a handful of real ingredients to make a delicious sourdough loaf. And that is the sourdough starter, good bread flour, salt, and water. Four things, that's it. That sandwich loaf I showed you earlier, that's all that's in that. It is real food. When you go to the store and you buy a loaf of bread, whether it be sourdough or not, whether it be the healthiest bread you can find on the shelf or not, it's still gonna have more than those four ingredients. So that's it. A bread flour really is key as well. You need something with a lot of structure and that's what the gluten does. The gluten proteins give the bread its structure. So if you are going to the store, you want to look for either a whole wheat flour or what they're gonna call a bread flour. I am going to be grinding my own wheat berries. You're gonna see me do that in a second. I have a Mock Mill 100 grain grinder. I've had it for probably close to two years now. I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it. So the wheat berries, which look like this, they have a very long shelf life in this form. And so I grind on demand. When you buy flour in the store, I don't care if it's all purpose, whole wheat, whatever it is, I would recommend that you put it in the freezer for just a couple of days, four days max, right? Before you start to use it and store it in your pantry. So you've seen me pull my all purpose container out, the all purpose flour. That flour went into the freezer as soon as I brought it home from the store or if I picked it up for an Azure order. And then eventually after a week or so, just whenever I get to it, I put it in the container and then in the pantry. The reason for that is weevils. So weevils are this tiny little bug and the females will go ahead and lay eggs within the grain while even still they're out in the field. And even throughout the whole processing and the grinding and the, the milling process, sometimes the eggs remain intact and they hatch once the wheat berry has been um, ground, has been ground up, the, the eggs actually hatch. It sounds so disgusting. And it has happened to me before with a bag I purchased in the store, just an all-purpose flour. I remember I pulled it out and I could see these little black things just in the canister. I hadn't even taken the lid off. It was the first time it happened to me. So granted, it's not often, but it happens and you should be aware of that. The way to kill them is to just go ahead and put it in the freezer. So I don't care what flour you buy, put it in the freezer when you get home from the store just for a few days to kill anything, larva, eggs, whatever it is, and then you can put it in your pantry. So I know that was like a little tangent, but I think it was important for you to know. I think everyone should put their flour in the freezer when they buy it. So when you buy the whole wheat berry, like I do, and I buy all of ours from Azure Standard, this is a hard white wheat. So there's a hard red and a hard white. And those are really gluten heavy, structure friendly flours or, or grains to make a good flour for bread. So I'm gonna use hard white today. And so when you buy the berries, you don't have to worry about the weevils and the eggs and all of that. It, it just doesn't happen, right? So I grind on demand and I don't have to worry about it. And my wheat berries are shelf stable. So I'm going to grind out my flour. I realize that you may not do that and that's okay. Go buy yourself a really good whole wheat or bread flour. Salt, when it comes to salt, I'm using Redmond Real Salt. That is the only salt we use in this house and it is a fantastic salt. It's from right here in the United States. It's not mined in the way that Himalayan pink salt is, and there can be a lot of political effects with the mining of a Himalayan pink salt, so that's why we have stuck strictly with the Redmond Real Salt, 
and it really is full of minerals and so good for you. And I have a code down below where you can actually go 15% off on your next order of Redmond Real Salt. So that covers the flour, the yeast, and the salt. Last is water. I just use filtered water when I make our sourdough loaves. You can use whey. If you ever do cheese making and you have some leftover whey, by all means, use that. So we are going to measure out 500 grams of flour. I'm gonna grinding in the mock mill. I have my scale here with a bowl that fits nicely in it, and so that way I can start weighing out my flour. But I have this beautiful pottery bowl, and this is what I use to make all of my bread loaves, sourdough bread loaves, and anything else. And so if you're starting to make a lot of bread or bread products, get yourself a bowl that you love to use, that you find beauty in, because it just makes the whole experience <laughs> that much more enjoyable. Okay, so when you're using a mock mill, you always wanna turn it on first before you add in your wheat berries. It is gonna be a little loud, but you never wanna add them in and then turn the machine on because the stone, the stones that grain, or excuse me, the stones that grind the wheat berries could get stuck. So I'm gonna tear that and we're gonna to go to 500. edited obviously some of that process out for you so you didn't have to listen to the machine the whole time but I would say the total time it took to grind that was maybe two minutes it wasn't long at all and we've got now our 500 grams of beautiful hard white wheat that is freshly ground now with you if you are starting this process with your starter this morning already doubled you just had your 500 grains of uh, grain measured out. A lot of this you're skipping, right? My process is just a little bit more involved today because I'm grinding my own wheat berries as well as I had to feed my starter this morning. The next thing we're gonna do is measure out 350 grams of water. And so I have a measuring cup here and the scale is teared to zero and we're gonna go to 350. And to that, we're gonna add about, I never have an exact number, um, but we're gonna pour in some of our sourdough starter and I usually go anywhere between 65 to 80 grams. So I'm gonna tear that. There's 75, that's perfectly good. Just set that aside. And now we have our starter and water together and I just stir it up. And the whole reason I put the starter in the water is so that when I pour the water into the flour, it just helps distribute the yeast a little bit better. Rather than pouring the water in here and then just dripping in the starter, it may not get mixed in and distributed across the flour as easily. So as you can see, this just helps even it out. And I'm just gonna throw in a couple of teaspoons, just a couple of pinches of Redmond Real Salt. and then I pour this in. Use a spoon and just start mixing it up. Get it as incorporated as I can and then I use my hands. I bought this pottery bowl directly from the artist in Kennebunkport, Maine. I'm, I'm from Maine originally, and so when my parents lived there, I would often visit, and there was this one pottery store, 
in the downtown area, in the Kennebunkport area, that oh, they just had the most beautiful pieces. And I have so many pieces of pottery from them. I think pottery is just one of those things in a kitchen that not only has so many uses, right? It's not utilitarian. It just has so many uses, but it adds so much beauty and character. Kind of a pottery junkie. So I'm just getting my hand in here to really work it through and get a lot of that flour up. It's not sticky. So when you're doing this, you should be able to stick your hands in and have them come out soaking wet, right? The ratio of 500 grams flour to 350 grams of water really makes this beautiful dough. All right, and now we're gonna let that rest. I'm gonna cover that up. I like to use these pieces of fabric that are coated with beeswax. And we're gonna set this on the counter. So I have it right here. I'm gonna let it sit there for probably about an hour to an hour and a half. And then at that point, we'll start doing our first set of pulls. Now, when you're making your sourdough bread, it does take time now, but the time that your hands and your, your involvement in it is not much. Sourdough can be intimidating. It can feel lengthy. It can feel like this process if you let it. If you just see it for what it is and really take out any emotional connection as far as what you think it is, you'll realize that it's not a hard process and it doesn't take much time or involvement at all. So you saw we mixed up the dough. That took, what, a couple of minutes? I'm gonna let that sit for about an hour and a half and then we'll do our first set of pulls. It's actually been two hours, so. Time got away from me, but that's all right. We're gonna go ahead and do our first set of pulls. This is one of four. When you feel the dough, it's gonna feel really kind of soft. Like you can tell it's come together a little bit. And all I'm doing is pull, fold. I've, and then turned it around. Pull, fold. I'm not taking any major, major strength, right? This is not a, a strength contest and I'm not trying to Break the dough, pull, fold, and that's it. So I did three of them, turning it each time. I'm gonna cover it back up. We'll come back and do the next pull in about an hour or an hour and a half. All right, let's do pull number two. We're gonna do the same thing. Remember, we're doing gentle pulls and folds. We don't wanna damage the dough. I only do about three or four. Cover it back up. Let it rest. It's been two hours since the last pull. So let's get pull number three done. And just same as before. Gently pull and fold. Gently pull and fold. Gently pull and fold. We got one more pull and after that pull we'll put it right into our loaf pan for the bulk rise. All right, fourth and final pull. And it's time after we do the pull to get it into our pan. So I am using um, this pan, it's called USA Pan and I'll link to it down below. I got it on Amazon. And it has these ridges in here, which I have found makes the bread come out really easy. However, before I start folding, I do drizzle a little bit of olive oil and no matter what kind of bread pan you're using, if you're using just a standard loaf pan, I would still recommend doing just a little bit of olive oil because you're going through all of this work and the last thing you want is for your bread to stick. So I just get the creases and then I get the sides. And that's ready. Set that aside, 
pick up our dough. And I pull, fold, pull, fold, and then I'm just going to stretch it out a little bit again, very gently. I do not want to damage the dough and poke holes in it or anything like that. But what I'm doing is stretching it out to the length of the pan and then we're gonna roll it. And so the whole purpose is to create some surface tension so that when it's in the oven and it's rising, you get that big, beautiful dome on the top. Okay, so I'm just gonna then roll this gently. I'm not pressing down. And then I'm gonna fold under a little bit. And so it creates this beautiful tension right here. Put that in the pan. I'm going to cover it and I'm going to proof this in the refrigerator overnight. But I am going to cover it and just leave it in the fridge like this. See you in the morning. Good morning. It has been about 11 hours since I put the dough in the refrigerator. So I took it out an hour ago and it hasn't really risen much, but I want you to see how it has expanded into the pan. And so a couple of things I need you to know here. You put it in the refrigerator to proof because it takes longer to proof, right? The bulk fermentation, proofing, there's a couple different terms you can use, but it takes longer if you put it in the refrigerator. Same thing, the same principle rather, as with your sourdough starter, right? You keep it on the counter, it doubles, it grows, it digests everything faster, whereas you put it in the refrigerator, it doesn't kill it, it just slows it down. Same thing with your dough. So you put it in the refrigerator at night, so that it doesn't proof so fast because that line between perfectly proofed to overproofed is a really thin line. So you put it in at night so you can go to sleep. <laughs> you can get up in the morning, you can do your things and not worry. So when I got up this morning, I took it out of the refrigerator and just put it here on the counter. I'm going to leave it on the counter for probably another hour. I'll come back in an hour and that's probably when I will bake it. So understand that I get it. People have busy lives, there's jobs, there's things that you know need to happen that have a higher priority than worrying about your sourdough loaf. And so that's why if you keep in the refrigerator, go to work the next, you know, go to work, wake up the next morning, go to work, leave it in the fridge. You can actually probably come home from work and bake it. It will probably be perfectly proofed and not overproofed. So you can put it in the refrigerator the night before, keep it in all day the next day until four or five o'clock, six o'clock, and then bake your bread and have fresh baked bread for that night. So there's a couple of ways to do that, right? If you put it in the refrigerator, or excuse me, you put it in the pan, like, like last night, if I had put this in the pan at say 11 p.m., went to bed late, I could have gotten up at six or seven and probably, depending upon the temperature, it would be perfectly proofed and I could just bake it right away. So we're just putting it in the refrigerator to stall the process, give you some time to live life, and then come to it when you're ready. Like I had mentioned, I took it out an hour ago. It's proofing well, but I'd like it to get a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna go for a walk. I'm gonna leave this on the counter for one more hour and I'll come back and show you what it looks like then and we'll probably bake. It's been one hour, slight change. It's come up a little bit more. So I think it is perfectly proofed and I just preheated the oven, or I just turned the oven on to 450 degrees. Once it's ready and preheated, I'm gonna put this in and bake it for 40 minutes.
The bread is done. How beautiful is that? It's very hot, so I'm not gonna pick it up. We're gonna let that cool. And then we have another wonderful, beautiful sourdough sandwich loaf, homemade right here on the homestead. I know there will be questions and there will be roadblocks. There will be missteps. It's part of the sourdough journey. It's part of any bread baking journey, really. I've had plenty myself. So I'm here for you to go along in this journey. This was just the first thing we get to make with our sourdough starter. Once your starter is mature, you only have to feed it when you want to use it. So if you are done using it for today, for example, you'll just put it in your refrigerator and then when you want to bake again, take it out a day ahead and feed it and then you know let it get really active and bubbly and double in volume and then you're ready to use it. Let me know what questions you have. I'm here to help. Stay healthy, stay well. See you next time.